The Gypsy Prophecy by Bram Stoker Narrated by Peter Silverleaf I really think, said the doctor, that at any rate one of us should go and try whether or not the thing is an imposture. Good, said Considine. After dinner we'll take our cigars and stroll over to the camp. Accordingly, when the dinner was over and the Latour finished, Joshua Considine and his friend Dr. Burley went over to the east side of the moor where the gypsy encampment lay. As they were leaving, Mary Considine, who had walked as far as the end of the garden where it opened into the laneway, called after her husband. Mind, Joshua, you are to give them a fair chance, but don't give them any clue to a fortune, and don't you get flirting with any of the gypsy maidens, and take care to keep Gerald out of harm. For answer, Considine held up his hand, as if taking a stage oath, and whistled the air of the old song, The Gypsy Countess. Gerald joined in the strain, and then, breaking into merry laughter, the two men passed along the laneway to the common, turning now and then to wave their hands to Mary, who leaned over the gate in the twilight looking after them. It was a lovely evening in the summer. The very air was full of rest and quiet happiness, as though an outward type of the peacefulness and joy which made a heaven of the home of the young married folk. Considine's life had not been an eventful one. The only disturbing element which he had ever known was in his wooing of Mary Winston, and the long-continued objection of her ambitious parents, who expected a brilliant match for their only daughter. When Mr. and Mrs. Winston had discovered the attachment of the young barrister, they had tried to keep the young people apart by sending their daughter away for a long round of visits, having made her promise not to correspond with her lover during her absence. Love, however, had stood the test. Neither absence nor neglect seemed to cool the passion of the young man, and jealousy seemed a thing unknown to his sanguine nature. So, after a long period of waiting, the parents had given in, and the young folk were married. They had been living in the cottage a few months, and were just beginning to feel at home. Gerald Burley, Joshua's old college chum, and himself a sometime victim of Mary's beauty, had arrived a week before to stay with them for as long as time as he could tear himself away from his work in London. When her husband had quite disappeared, Mary went into the house, and sitting down at the piano, gave an hour to Mendelssohn. It was but a short walk across the common, and before the cigars had required renewing, the two men had reached the gypsy camp. The place was as picturesque as gypsy camps, when in villages, when business is good, usually are. There were some few persons round the fire, investing their money in prophecy, and a large number of others, poorer or more parsimonious, who stayed just outside the bounds, but near enough to see all that went on. As the two gentlemen approached, the villagers who knew Joshua made way a little, and a pretty keen-eyed gypsy girl tripped up and asked to tell their fortunes. Joshua held out his hand, but the girl, without seeming to see it, stared at his face in a very odd manner. Gerald nudged him. "'You must cross her hand with silver,' he said. "'It is one of the most important parts of the mystery.' Joshua took from his pocket a half-crown and held it out to her, but without looking at it she answered, "'You have to cross the gypsy's hand with gold.' Gerald laughed. "'You are at a premium as a subject,' he said. Joshua was of the kind of man, the universal kind, who can tolerate being stared at by a pretty girl. So with some little deliberation he answered, All right, here you are. My pretty girl, you must give me a real good fortune for it. And he handed her a half-sovereign, which she took, saying, It is not for me to give good fortune or bad, but only to read what the stars have said. She took his right hand and turned it palm upward, but the instant her eyes met it, she dropped it as though it had been red hot, and with a startled look glided swiftly away. Lifting the curtain of the large tent, which occupied the centre of the camp, 
she disappeared within. Sold again, said the cynical Gerald. Joshua stood a little amazed, and not altogether satisfied. They both watched the large tent. In a few moments there emerged from the opening not the young girl, but a stately-looking woman of middle age and commanding presence. The instant she appeared the whole camp seemed to stand still. The clamour of tongues, the laughter and noise of the work were, for a second or two, arrested, and every man or woman who sat or crouched or lay stood up and faced the imperial-looking gypsy. "'The Queen, of course,' murmured Gerald. "'We're in luck to-night.' The gypsy queen threw a searching glance around the camp, and then, without hesitating an instant, came straight over and stood before Joshua. "'Hold out your hand,' she said in a commanding tone. Again Gerald spoke, sotto voce. I've not been spoken to in that way since I was at school. Your hand must be crossed with gold. A hundred percent at this game, whispered Gerald, as Joshua laid another half-sovereign on his upturned palm. The gypsy looked at the hand with knitted brows, and then suddenly looking up into his face said, Have you a strong will? Have you a true heart that can be brave for one you love? I hope so, but I am afraid I have not vanity enough to say yes. Then I will answer for you, for I read resolution in your face, resolution desperate and determined if need be. You have a wife you love. Yes, emphatically. Then leave her at once. Never see her face again. Go from her now, while love is fresh and your heart is free from wicked intent. Go, go far, and never see her face again. Joshua drew away his hand quickly and said, Thank you stiffly but sarcastically, as he began to move away. "'I say,' said Gerald, "'you're not going like that, old man. No use in being indignant with the stars or their prophet. And moreover, your sovereign, what of it? At least hear the matter out.' "'Silence, ribald,' commanded the Queen. "'You know nor what you do. Let him go, and go ignorant, if he will not be warned.' Joshua immediately turned back. At all events, we will see this thing out, he said. Now, madam, you have given me advice, but I paid for a fortune. Be warned, said the gypsy. The stars have been silent for long. Let the mystery still wrap them round. My dear madam, I do not get within touch of a mystery every day, and I prefer for my money knowledge rather than ignorance. I can get the latter commodity for nothing when I want any of it. Gerald echoed the sentiment. As for me, I have a large and unsaleable stock on hand. The gypsy queen eyed the two men sternly, and then said, As you wish. You have chosen for yourself, and have met warning with scorn, and appeal with levity. On your own heads be the doom. Amen, said Gerald. With an imperious gesture the queen took Joshua's hand again, and began to tell his fortune. I see here the flowing of blood. It will flow before long. It is running in my sight. It flows through the broken circle of a severed ring. Go on, said Joshua, smiling. Gerald was silent. Must I speak plainer? Certainly. We commonplace mortals want something definite. The stars are a long way off, and their words get somewhat dulled in the message. The gypsy shuddered, and then spoke impressively. This is the hand of a murderer. The murderer of his wife. She dropped a hand and turned away. Joshua laughed. Do you know, said he, I think if I were you I should prophesy some jurisprudence into my system. For instance, you say this is the hand, the hand of a murderer. Well, whatever it may be in the future, or potentially, it is at present not one. You ought to give your prophecy in such terms as the hand which will be a murderer's, or rather the hand of one who will be the murderer of his wife. The stars are really not good on technical questions. The gypsy made no reply of any kind, but, with drooping head and despondent mien, 
walked slowly to her tent and, lifting the curtain, disappeared. Without speaking, the two men turned homewards and walked across the moor. Presently, after some little hesitation, uh, Gerald spoke. Of course, old man, this is all a joke, a ghastly one, but still a joke. But would it not be well to keep it to ourselves? How do you mean? Well, not tell your wife. It might alarm her. Alarm her, my dear Gerald? What are you thinking of? Why, she would not be alarmed or afraid of me if all the gypsies that ever didn't come from Bohemia agreed that I was to murder her, or even to have a hard thought of her, while so long as she was saying, Jack Robinson. Gerald remonstrated. Old fellow, women are superstitious, far more than we men are, and also they are blessed or cursed with a nervous system to which we are strangers. I see too much of it in my work not to realise it. Take my advice, and, and do not let her know, or you will frighten her. Joshua's lips unconsciously hardened as he answered, My dear fellow, I would not have a secret from my wife. Why, it would be the beginning of a new order of things between us. We have no secrets from each other. If we ever have, then you may begin to look out for something odd between us. Still, said Gerald, at the risk of unwelcome interference, I say again, be warned in time. The gypsy's very words, said Joshua. You and she seemed quite of one accord. Tell me, old man, is this a put-up thing? You told me of the gypsy camp. Did you arrange it all with Her Majesty? This was said with an air of bantering earnestness. Gerald assured him that he only heard of the camp that morning, but he made fun of every answer of his friend, and, in the process of this raillery, the time passed, and they entered the cottage. Mary was sitting at the piano, but not playing. The dim twilight had waked some very tender feelings in her breast, and her eyes were full of gentle tears. When the men came in, she stole over to her husband's side and kissed him. Joshua struck a tragic attitude. Mary, he said in a deep voice, before you approach me, listen to the words of fate. The stars have spoken, and the doom is sealed. What is it, dear? Tell me the fortune, but do not frighten me. Not at all, my dear. But there is a truth which it is well that you should know. Nay, it is necessary, so that all your arrangements can be made beforehand, and everything be decently done and in order. Go on, dear, I am listening. Mary Considine, your effigy may yet be seen at Madame Tussaud's. The Juris imprudent stars have announced their fell tidings that this hand is red with blood, your blood. Mary, Mary, my God! He sprang forward, but too late to catch her as she fell, fainting on the floor. I told you, said Gerald, you don't know them as well as I do. After a little while, Mary recovered from her swoon, but only to fall into strong hysterics, in which she laughed and wept and raved and cried, Keep him from me, from me! Joshua, my husband, and many other words of entreaty and of fear. Joshua Considine was in a state of mind bordering on agony, and when at last Mary became calm, he knelt by her and kissed her feet and hands and hair and called her all the sweet names and said all the tender things his lips could frame. All that night he sat by her bedside and held her hand. Far through the night and up to the early morning she kept waking from sleep and crying out as if in fear, till she was comforted by the consciousness that her husband was watching beside her. Breakfast was late the next morning, but during it Joshua received a telegram which required him to drive over to Withering, nearly twenty miles. He was loath to go, but Mary would not hear of his remaining, and so before noon he drove off in his dog-cart alone. When he was gone, Mary retired to her room. She did not appear at lunch, but when afternoon tea was served on the lawn under the great weeping willow, she came to join her guest. She was looking quite recovered from her illness of the evening before. After some casual remarks, she said to Gerald, Of course, it was very silly about last night, but I could not help feeling frightened. Indeed, I would feel so still if I let myself think of it. But after all, these people may only imagine things— and I have got a test that can hardly fail to show that the prediction is false, if indeed it be false, she added sadly. What is your plan? asked Gerald. 
I shall go myself to the gypsy camp and have my fortune told by the Queen. Capital! May I go with you? Oh, no, that would spoil it. She might know you and guess at me and suit her utterance accordingly. I shall go alone this afternoon. When the afternoon was gone, Mary Considine took her way to the gypsy encampment. Gerald went with her as far as the near edge of the common and returned alone. Half an hour had hardly elapsed when Mary entered the drawing-room, where he lay on a sofa reading. She was ghastly pale and was in a state of extreme excitement. Hardly had she passed over the threshold when she collapsed and sank, moaning on the carpet. Gerald rushed to aid her, but by a great effort she controlled herself and motioned him to be silent. He waited, and his ready attention to her wish seemed to be her best help, for in a few minutes she had somewhat recovered and was able to tell him what had passed. When I got to the camp, she said, there did not seem to be a soul about. I went into the centre and stood there. Suddenly a tall woman stood beside me. Something told me I was wanted, she said. I held out my hand and laid a piece of silver on it. She took from her neck a small golden trinket and laid it there also, and then, seizing the two, threw them into the stream that ran by. And then she took my hand in hers and spoke, naught but blood in this guilty place, and turned away. I caught hold of her and asked her to tell me more. After some hesitation she said, Alas, alas, I see you lying at your husband's feet, and his hands are red with blood. Gerald did not feel at all at ease, and tried to laugh it off. Surely, he said, this woman has a craze about murder. Do not laugh, said Mary, I cannot bear it. And then, as if with a sudden impulse, she left the room. Not long after, Joshua returned, bright and cheery, and as hungry as a hunter after his long drive. His presence cheered his wife, who seemed much brighter, but she did not mention the episode of the visit to the gypsy camp, so Gerald did not mention it either. As if by tacit consent, the subject was not alluded to during the evening. But there was a strange, settled look on Mary's face, which Gerald could not but observe. In the morning, Joshua came down to breakfast later than usual. Mary had been up and about the house from an early hour, but as the time drew on she seemed to get a little nervous, and now and again threw around an anxious look. Gerald could not help noticing that none of those at breakfast could get on satisfactorily with their food. It was not altogether that the chops were tough, but that the knives were all so blunt. Being a guest, he, of course, made no sign, but presently saw Joshua draw his thumb across the edge of his knife in an unconscious sort of way. At the action, Mary turned pale and almost fainted. After breakfast, they all went out on the lawn. Mary was making up a bouquet and said to her husband, Get me a few of the tea roses, dear. Joshua pulled down a cluster from the front of the house. The stem bent, but was too tough to break. He put his hand in his pocket to get his knife, but in vain. Lend me your knife, Gerald, he said. But Gerald had not got one, so he went into the breakfast room and took one from the table. He came out, feeling its edge and grumbling. What on earth has happened to all the knives? The edges seemed all ground off. Mary turned away hurriedly and entered the house. Joshua tried to sever the stalk with the blunt knife, as country cooks sever the necks of fowl, as schoolboys cut twine. With a little effort he finished the task. The cluster of roses grew thick, so he determined to gather a great bunch. He could not find a single sharp knife in the sideboard where the cutlery was kept, so he called Mary and when she came told her the state of things. She looked so agitated and so miserable that he could not help knowing the truth, and, as if astounded and hurt, asked her, Do you mean to say that you have done it? She broke in. Oh, Joshua, I was so afraid. He paused, and a set, white look came over his face. Mary, said he, is this all the trust you have in me? I would not have believed it. Oh, Joshua, Joshua, 
she cried entreatingly, forgive me, and wept bitterly. Joshua thought a moment and then said, I see how it is. We shall better end this or we shall all go mad. He ran into the drawing room. Where are you going? almost screamed Mary. Gerald saw what he meant, that he would not be tied to blunt instruments by the force of a superstition, and was not surprised when he saw him come out through the French window, bearing in his hand a large Gurkha knife, which usually lay on the centre table, and which his brother had sent him from northern India. It was one of those great hunting knives which worked such havoc at close quarters with the enemies of the loyal Gurkhas during the mutiny, of great weight but so evenly balanced in the hand as to seem light, and with an edge like a razor. With one of these knives a Gurkha can cut a sheep in two. When Mary saw him come out of the room, with the weapon in his hand she screamed in an agony of fright, and the hysterics of last night were promptly renewed. Joshua ran toward her, and seeing her falling, threw down the knife and tried to catch her. However, he was just a second too late, and the two men cried out in horror simultaneously as they saw her fall upon the naked blade. When Gerald rushed over, he found that in falling her left hand had struck the blade, which lay partly upwards on the grass. Some of the small veins were cut through, and the blood gushed freely from the wound. As he was tying it up, he pointed out to Joshua that the wedding ring was severed by the steel. They carried her fainting to the house. When, after a while, she came out with her arm in a sling, she was peaceful in her mind and happy. She said to her husband, The gypsy was wonderfully near the truth, too near for the real thing ever to occur now, dear. Joshua bent over and kissed the wounded hand.